coming up on One, how to talk yourself into a new career as a fast-talking auctioneer. See how cadavers are making a difference in med school teaching and visitors to the old Amway Arena lament its demolition as it comes crashing down. And mmm, you can almost taste the chocolate treats as we take a trip to a chocolate festival. All that and more in this edition of One. I'm Amy Rogers and thanks for joining us for One, WUCF's magazine show that features stories about people, places, and events around Central Florida. Every month we'll bring you stories that show off our communities and we'll profile individuals that make our region unique. We've all had our experiences with low talkers and loud talkers, but what about fast talkers? I mean auctioneers. And there's a course for that. It's where salesmanship, personality, and fast talking meet. Buddy Pittman shows us what it takes to become a successful auctioneer. 30, 5 dollars bid 7, half dollar bid not 40. 40 dollar bid 40 once, 40 to bid good, 40 dollar bid 40 twice, last call 40 bucks, sold. 37 a half to that handsome fellow in the front row. Once you get behind the microphone, and you get that, that feel of controlling the crowd and working a crowd and, and they like you and they're responding to you and everything, it's, uh, it's really a feeling that you can't get over. So then, then, you're, then you're ready. So give me that microphone. Turn me loose. Give me 40. I got 20. 20. I'm going to go 30. Got 20. 30. Not 40. Got 30. 40. Not a bit 40. 50. 50. Sir, get back in here about now at 50. It's an unbelievable job. The money is phenomenal in this business. Um, typically, a good auctioneer will make six figures. Uh, the people that come through this school, we've had actors, actresses, NASCAR drivers, uh, CEOs, Fortune 50 companies, doctors, lawyers, dentists. You know, coach. You know, I told you coach for a lot of years. Co coach is a good word for an auctioneer. I work for the Orange County Sheriff's Office. Now 10, 10, 10 anywhere. I have 10. Now 15, now 15, now 15, now 15, now 15, now 20. Now 20. I'm in a unit that handles the sale of all the vehicles, the surplus vehicles, and seized vehicles of the Sheriff's Office, and we sell them at auction. The sheriff has sent me here to learn this school to help do those auction sales. I'm a retired funeral director from New Jersey. I got five dollar bid now, seven, eight, ten, fifteen, twenty. Thirty, 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 thirty dollar bid, sold. Thirty dollars, four and fifty-seven is the buyer. Nice job. Currently, I am the transportation director in a retirement home. And um, it's just, I need my freedom back. Spent the last 20 years working for one of the Giants, Universal Studios in Orlando. 15, got to go 20. Can I get 20? 20, got my 20, can I get 25? 25, can I get 25? Got my 25, can I get 30? Looking for a second career, and it's going to be in sales. I wanted to have as much fun as I have for the last 20 years. I got 10, no, 15, 15, no, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. All right, it's Friday night. Time to put them through their live auction. This is what they've trained and worked for all week long. It's showtime. Anyone at five, set it in, anyone. Come on, now first piece. Someone bid on something here. Four, three. Thank you. I got eight. Looking for eight. Looking for eight. I've got seven. Looking for eight. Nine, 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 dot a nine, dot a nine, dot a nine, dot a nine. 15, now 17, 50. 15, now 17, 50, 17, 50. Go, go. Would you, could you, could you? Gone, gone, $15. Oh, that was great. That was more fun than I expected it to be. It really, really was exciting once it got going. It was really a lot of fun. Let's not be shy. Come on, hold those cards up. Let's get seven and a half going. We have about six. We got six right now. Five's right now. Five? No one else? All right, we sold them five. That was fantastic. I mean, the adrenaline started going. You just sit there talking to people and having a good time. That's what makes it all worthwhile, you know? First, I was a little bit nervous getting out there, but once it started going, it was great. 10, better 15, 12 and a half. 12 and a half, now half and a half, now half. Sold her out $10. What's your number? That was about the most exciting thing I've done in a long time. A little nervous there, but, you know, once you get going, you know, it just takes over from there. So I liked it a lot. $7.50. Right here, seven dollars fifty cents. Come on, you can put your mom in if you have to. Uh, right here, seven dollars fifty cents. All right. Uh, so, buyer number one hundred five. Thank you very much. <laughs> See, it's over. You did great, man. Sorry, good job. Nice job. All right. Very good.
Many graduates of the school say that the course was one of the most enjoyable nine days of education that they've ever had. If you would like to check it out, visit FAA.com. The Florida Auctioneer Academy holds classes every couple of months. On a more subdued note, others are using the downturn in the economy to create their own income by turning a passion for gardening into a flourishing community farm. Maya Fialos shows us a growing business that is both healthy and profitable. I started Sunview Gardens shortly after we moved on to our land here in 1983. At first I was selling my produce at the Winter Park Farmers Market, but folks were following me home from the market and wanting to pick directly from my gardens, so eventually it all evolved into a U-Pick farm. We're starting to get a bulb forming on the base of this. Well, I took a break from actually growing the garden as a source of income for a number of years. We have three kids now and I had to get a haircut and get a real job. And about two years ago, I could see that with the economy doing so poorly, I was going to jump back into my gardening career. Um, working night shifts at Disney, luckily I had rebuilt the garden, had all the infrastructure in place, and at the same time with the local food movement really picking up speed, it was a very good opportunity to jump back into growing crops. Most of the vegetables we grow are very quick, high turnover produce crops. I grow scallions, carrots, kohlrabi, a lot of greens and salad fixings. It's been very turnkey productively to every year just harvest the fruit from them after the initial work was accomplished. A lot of times on TV when I see somebody who's been laid off for a long time, they're asking someone to give them a job. My creating my own job took me beyond that. <laughs> there are many community farms across the Central Florida area emphasizing homegrown organic produce. You can find out more at homegrown.locallygrown.net. It's not something we like to think about, but ask yourself, what are your last wishes for when you pass on? If you've ever considered donating your body to science, then maybe this will help you decide. On a recent visit to the College of Medicine's Anatomy Lab at UCF, we saw the crucial training future doctors are getting from working with cadavers. Robert Swanson has more. I see the eagerness to learn in, in a lot of these young men and women. I've decided to go ahead and donate my body to, to science, to the, to the university. It was the fact that I had a heart attack last June. Um, I've had off and on health problems since then and I just think it's really important for the uh, for the young people the up-and-coming doctors to have the experience to to know basically how a body is put together how it comes apart and how to fix it when it's broke this is their first patient their opportunity to learn and and to learn on a cadaver is much more important than trying to do that for the first time on some stranger that walks into your your clinical office. We have an amazing anatomy lab here and the facilities are incredible and we have incredible teachers here but with the cadavers here we get to build our dissection skills and uh, learn anatomy in a completely new way. You don't really get a feel for the three-dimensional aspect of the bodies uh, until you really see um, you know in front of you so you're looking at an arm you really don't understand the, the layers I guess that you can see in a book because it's just you flip between pages and it's just amazing actually reveal one layer to the next. You know, where a mechanic can look at a book when they're fixing a car, uh, there's nobody standing in front of a doctor holding a book, you know, they, they have to, to learn it and have it, you know, in their head and everything, and what better way to, uh, to do that than for them to have hands-on experience. Online, you can see a three-dimensional look of it, and it's nothing like the lab. It's nothing like going in and dissecting a real the real muscle, seeing the real bones, especially because in the real world, there's so much variation in bodies. So on this side, which part is the trigone muscle? Well, the difficulty here is this, this bladder is contracted down, and it's very difficult to see. It's, it's not the ideal one to look at. In anatomy lab, this is our only time, I believe, in our medical career that we are able to cut more. When you're in any kind of a surgery or, you know, with a living person, your goal is to cut less. They have to understand that people are different, 
Uh, we all have two arms, two legs, and a head, but we are different sizes, we've had different illnesses, we've had different pathologies, we've had different surgeries, and a computer can't duplicate that. So coming into this anatomy lab, the folks who will their bodies to this particular program uh, provide that opportunity for the students to see the richness of the human body, the diversity of the human body. I've always been an organ donor and then when I came to work for the university uh, I learned more and more about the anatomy donor program. You know even though someone's passed on and so on they treat the, by the cadavers and so on with the utmost respect, dignity. A lot of times they're often called silent teachers and they're even more than that. They teach you so much and not just teaching you the muscles and looking through it but they teach you even as a doctor the things you want to care about when you become a physician, not just through this first year of anatomy, but when you become a real doctor, these are the things you need to look at. These are the things you need to be taking care of. So they're teaching us more than, you know, anything else could. I'm proud to say that I am a, a donor. In 2011, 335 people willed their bodies to the State Anatomical Board. If you're interested in donating your body to the UCF College of Med, go to med.ucf.edu and search for Willed Body Program for more information. Coming up later in the show, meet the Oviedo Chickens and how they've become a mainstay for downtown Oviedo. But first, we want to bring you some events you might like to know about. Each month, we want to recognize nonprofits who are working hard at making a difference in their community. So if you have a special event or have volunteer opportunities that you want to publicize, let us know about it. Let's take a look. If you'd like your nonprofit event listed, email us at WUCF. Our email address is one at ucf.edu and reference nonprofit in the subject line. Please give us at least two months' notice before the event. Earlier this spring, one of Orlando's landmarks came crashing down with nearly as much fanfare as when it first opened. But for some old Amway Arena fans, it wasn't just the demolition of a building, but the end of an era. David Waters was there to see the building go down. A season ticket holder since year one. The first game, first Magic game we were here, it was very exciting. It was a new team, new arena, new experience for Orlando, and had to come and watch it come down. Just a new, I don't know, something new for Orlando. People said we would never be an NBA team. We didn't have the fan support. We didn't have anything. We didn't have the interest. Really wasn't a basketball fan about a year and a half ago. I met Leslie and haven't missed a game since. Here we are, 20 some years later, with a new state of the art arena, with a great basketball team, and it's just sort of sad they're taking this down. I loved it. I, I was at every game. When we went to the finals the last year, I was at every game. And uh, I used to go to the Cannon Club, hang out with all the people down there, slap the hands of the players. A lot of memories. You know, a lot of memories. Not only the Magic Games, but, you know, the ice shows, the Muppets, you know, concerts. Um, 20, what, 24 years. years? 23 years? 24 years? It's sad. Now it's just a pile of rubble. The Amway Arena area will make way for a new 68-acre creative village that will include facilities for arts, new media and high-tech production, and education facilities. Each month we're going to bring you a story about someone special, a segment we're calling One to Know. This month we're introducing you to Jeff Rupert. 
He's a saxophonist, a nationally renowned jazz musician who's worked with the likes of Mel Torme, Sam Rivers, and Benny Carter. He's also a UCF professor who's taking jazz class to a higher level, and his music is hitting a high note across the country. Jeff Rupert is this month's One to Know. Oh, I just love jazz. I feel like it shows me as much as I chose it. Uh, from the minute I heard jazz music as a kid, I, I knew that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to play jazz. Well, as the director of jazz studies, I oversee the, the program, and I specifically teach the jazz workshop, which is a playing group. It's an integrated teaching experience. The jazz program put out a CD called Jazz Town, a CD of all uh, of our student group, and another called The Jazz Professors. When we made these CDs, we created our own record company. Flying Horse Records is in the process of being born and growing. We're using the record company as a teaching mechanism for our kids. So they're learning about copywriting, they're learning how to run a record company. Both those records actually charted on the jazz charts. Jazz Town, the student group record, made it to 43 on the national jazz charts for 10 weeks. The Jazz Professors was 19 on the jazz charts for 17 weeks. Both these records have been getting good airplay all across the United States. We've been seeing exceptional sales in Chicago and Boston and New York which just fuels my fire to keep, keep trying. You can catch Rupert perform at concerts at UCF and around the Orlando area. We know that every town has a story. Maybe it's history, residence, or something that just needs telling. We'll bring you those stories in a segment we're calling Central Florida Hometown. And we begin with a question. Why did the chicken cross the road? Well, to get to Oviedo, of course. You may have seen a few chickens wandering around Oviedo Town Center and wondered, how did these colorful characters decide to make Oviedo their home? Well, we took a trip to see if we could track some down in this episode of Central Florida Hometown. We're a suburb and you have a couple dozen chickens wandering around here in the middle of town. They walk across the roads, they block traffic, but the weird thing about it is the majority of people in this, in this town really love the chickens. A bunch of us grad students uh, took a class to uh, create content for the Riches program. Uh, it's uh, something that the history department just started. Riches UCF is the regional initiative for the collecting of histories experiences and stories of Central Florida. We each got to pick uh, areas of Central Florida. I actually live here in Oviedo. We would do uh, three podcasts about little interesting bits of history that people might not know about and you know bring that in a new form of media to people that, that like history. Oviedo really has its roots in agriculture. You have people who have lived here their entire lives that when they grew up here, it wasn't uncommon to see a cow or a chicken or a pig wandering on the road. And then you have more people that have moved here and they live in gated communities and subdivisions that they commute to work everywhere. And for them, seeing a chicken is, is a big deal. So you, you get some tension there between the two of them. Sometime in, in the early 90s, uh, a, a chicken kind of showed up downtown. Uh, a couple weeks later, there was a hen. And then, as I say in the podcast, uh, the next spring, inevitably, there were baby chickens. From there, the population has just grown and gotten larger and larger. And now, I mean, nobody really touches them. Uh, they leave them be. Uh, it's, uh, it's a self-sustaining population of chickens. <laughs> they like to hang out in the several different spots around town. And uh, ironically, they like to hang out near the chicken restaurant across the street. <laughs> A lot of these uh, business owners think that it's, it's really interesting, it's unique to have chickens, and they've really adopted them as a sort of a mascot. I have a bunch of anecdotes about chickens crossing the road, so you gotta listen to the podcast to find out. <laughs> if one person listens to a podcast and gets interested in, in the history of their town because they found out why the chickens are in Oviedo, it's great to have somebody else interested in history. The chickens are protected by a City of Oviedo ordinance that covers all birds. Coming up, a fashion show with a chocolate theme and lots and lots of chocolate. But first, here's a look at some local events around the area.
If you're a chocolate fan, then this story is for you. A recent chocolate festival was in town to show off all that is sweet, creative, and even high fashion. It was much ado about chocolate. Bobby Fishbow was there to sample some of the treats. Chocolate is a decadent, sophisticated dessert. Here at the Festival of Chocolate, we have vendors from all over Orlando who come and show their pieces of brownies and ice cream and popsicles and cakes and almost every form of chocolate that you can think of, it's here. I love pretty much everything about chocolate. It's the perfect comfort food. You can have it literally any time of the day. It's perfect. The theme is, uh, is fashion, and of course I knew I would see a lot of dresses and a lot of hats and some slippers and things like that, some shoes, but I thought, well, how do you make that? You make that with, with scissors and buttons and thread, so I figured let me make the components that, that make those items, so that's another creative way of uh, showing fashion. This is the second Coca Couture fashion show that we had. The first one was in Tampa. For this show, we had 16 up and coming designers that came from the International Art and Design Technology School that's located here in Orlando. The students were required to use 50% or more wrappers. We did have a requirement to use chocolate, but in Tampa, we realized that it melted once it hit the body. So we decided to cut that out and just keep it to wrappers, which I find it makes it look more of a wearable outfit now, which is a great thing and we chose to have a Coca Couture fashion show because you can taste chocolate, but it's nice to be able to see it used in a different way as a garment. This dress that was nominated by the fans took about 200 wrappers. The designer was Veronica, and she took different types of M&Ms, peanut M&Ms, plain M&Ms, and pretzel, and you could tell the hard work that went into it, and it, was, it, it flowed. It, was just, it looked beautiful on the runway. We're doing brownie pops this year. These are actually made just like normal brownies. They're a fudgy brownie. And then we use little ice cream scoops and mold them into little balls. And then we put the stick in there. And then we just use the toppings just to give it some, some of them different flavors. Chocolate is probably one of the more difficult things to work with, like over buttercream. But it's really the most fun. And you could do so many different things with fudge. You could get swirly. We have this really cool rose design we can bake out of fudge put anything and it's just it's thick and it's rich and it's amazing and it just looks romantic and beautiful it's just awesome the festival of chocolate travels to cities in the southeast its next stop is in west palm beach in november thanks for joining us for this edition of one we leave you now with some smooth jazz sounds from jeff rupert see you next time